Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Well, during the offertory today, we're going to be singing a song that maybe you've heard before called, I Love to Tell the Story. This song was written in 1866, so it's been around a little while. Many of you have probably heard it. And many of you have probably sung it. But as I was listening to the song and contemplating its words in light of our gospel reading today, I felt convicted and I thought to myself this question. Do I really love to tell the story? Jesus has a sobering lesson to teach us and his disciples in our gospel reading today. And that lesson, simply put is you will be rejected. In the face of the possibility of such rejection, that question popped up in my mind once again. Do I really love to tell the story? So look at Mark chapter 6. The setting for our gospel reading today is just after Jesus has been thronged by crowds, he returns to his hometown. So at this point, Jesus has gained some notoriety. People know his name. They've associated him with miracles and with authoritative teaching. Remember, the the language in our gospel reading from last week is that the crowds were thronging about Jesus wherever he went. You don't usually describe those terms for a small group of people. So he returns to his hometown And he's teaching in the synagogue. And the result of Jesus, the Son of God himself, teaching in the synagogue isn't great. The people's reaction can be summed up with the phrase, who do you think you are? They know Jesus in a different setting. And they voice this with their questions, right? They say, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary We know his siblings. Some of them are here with us. Who is this guy to say such things? Who gives him such powers? Now, maybe you felt that way in your life before. right? You've grown up and you've gone off and you started your own life. And who can make you feel like a 12-year-old faster than your family? Jesus comes back to his hometown. They know Jesus there, not as this great teacher, but as a child who grew up in a house, who has siblings they know. And so they're unable to square this image of Jesus they know with the one that's now presented to them as this great teacher and healer and Messiah. And this section is summed up with this phrase that we get at the end of verse 3 to set up what Jesus is, the reaction they have to Jesus is summed up by this phrase. And they took offense at him. Let me say that one more time and let that sink in because remember the him we're talking about here is the perfect son of God. And they took offense at him. Now, is this more than Jesus and his hometown? Is what Jesus talking about here more than simply people who can't get past seeing the 12-year-old carpenter who didn't get back in the group with his parents after going to Jerusalem for the first time? They know his siblings. Is there something more going on here? Because if all we have is that part of the text, we might think, that this is just describing something Jesus personally dealt with because it was his own hometown. That maybe this doesn't really refer to the rejection that the disciples will face and by extension the rejection that we will face. But the text does not stop there. It continues. And Jesus continues to preach, teach, and do miracles in the surrounding villages. Notice that he doesn't spend much time dwelling on the unbelief of his hometown. It says he marvels at it, but the very next verse says, and then he went about to teach in the surrounding villages. 
And in the midst of doing this, then he sends out his disciples to do the very same thing. But when he sends them out, he gives them some practical instructions on how they shouldn't bring anything with them. All the things that you would normally expect to bring with you if you were being sent out on a trip or a mission. But he also includes a warning for them. And here's the warning. And if in any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. In other words, Jesus is telling his disciples, and he's telling us, there will be places where you will be rejected. There are going to be people who reject you and whatever you have to say. Now, knowing Jesus' disciples, you might think up some of the objections people might have along the same lines as Jesus' rejection in his hometown. Who do you think you are? You're just some uneducated fisherman from Galilee. How can someone as lowly as you speak of such great things and to people such as myself? Perhaps that's your worry. Perhaps that's your fear when Jesus sends you out to speak about him to others. Maybe you don't think you're qualified to speak about such things. But you have been made qualified. Notice when Jesus sends out his disciples, the first thing he does is he grants them authority. And he does that by giving them his word which we have ourselves, that makes you qualified, even if you are some uneducated fisherman from Galilee. Plus, when he gives them this warning, imagine what must be going through their minds, because the text tells us at the beginning, right, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. So they witnessed the rejection that their Lord faced in his hometown. So fresh off witnessing this rejection... Jesus gives them this warning. Now think about that for a moment, that Jesus himself is rejected. And think about all of the internal arguments and excuses that we give ourselves, that I do and that you do, about why we shouldn't, why we maybe will face rejection. Did Jesus not say something correctly? Was he wrongly insensitive towards the people that he was speaking to? Did he say something they felt was hateful? I don't think so. I mean, we're talking about the perfect son of God. So the fact that Jesus himself is rejected tells us that even if we say and do everything right, what Jesus is telling us here is that for the message you bring and his namesake alone, you will face rejection. If it happened to the Son of God, it's certainly going to happen to you and to me. So I ask you one more time, do you love to tell the story? That question bounced around in my head this week. Are you afraid of rejection? I'm afraid of it. And I know you are too. That's a normal human fear to be afraid of being rejected. Maybe some thoughts you've had is, if I really push this issue, what if my children reject me? What if my brother or sister, mother, father, friends, or coworkers reject me and label me as some sort of Jesus freak? Fear of this reality of rejection often muzzles us from telling the story from obeying our Lord's command when he sends his disciples out to preach and teach the good news of Jesus and his love. You see, the truth is, we don't always love to tell the story, do we? It's easy to tell it here in this space. I can assume everybody's on the same page. You came to church today because you're a believer in Jesus, and it's easy 
And it's a good that we talk about Jesus here because we need to hear it too. We are of like mind and of one spirit in Jesus here. But out there in the surrounding villages, if you will, out there in the community, in my workspace, even among my own earthly family, it may not be quite so easy, that fear of rejection rearing its ugly head. Do you love to tell the story? The law has a harsh teaching and revelation for us in the text. If you are telling the story, you will be rejected. It's going to happen. I mean, for crying out loud, the Son of God himself was rejected for telling this story, for bringing this message. And we can't argue that he was being hateful or deceitful or just ignorant because he was perfect in every way. So what does that mean for us? We're not perfect like Jesus. Sometimes when people reject us, they probably have good reason because sometimes we do say hateful things. Sometimes we do say things incorrectly or don't treat people with the love that we're called to treat them with. So where does that leave us? Because we still have this command. We are still sent out by our Lord. There was a conference at the seminary when I was attending there. And I remember one line from a presenter. I can't remember the presenter's name or what the presentation was about, but this one line really stuck in my head. And she said this, You better make sure that it is the gospel that is offensive and not you. Is an echo of a truth that we are imperfect people, right? And that there are times where maybe the reason the person rejected what I had to say wasn't because they were offended by the gospel, but it's a very real possibility that I offended them. And then we come here and we confess that sin and we go out and attempt to do it the way God intends us to do. So certainly, I'm not saying we are not offensive at times, we certainly are. We're sinners. You're going to mess up fulfilling this command of Jesus just like all the others. But this story is worth telling. It's worth enduring the shame of your own failures. It's worth enduring the shame of a rejection, even if the rejection is unjustified. Paul gives us a beautiful picture in this relationship with God for us in the epistle reading today. You're weak. So am I. We have a God whose power is made perfect in our weakness. Because built into that message that we're sent out to bring isn't, hey, look at me, the perfect one, and God loves me because I do everything right. The message is, let me tell you about a God who saved even me, the person who maybe snubbed you in the past, the person who maybe treated you unjustly, But now I've come to repent of that sin and tell you that even God, that God saved even me. But the lesson of this text still remains. You could be perfectly loving, speak all the truthful words of Jesus in love and hope, and give no personal offense in your demeanor and still be rejected. Yet God sends us out nonetheless. And when we look at his example, Jesus does that to the ultimate degree. And without any justification ever, rejected by the world to the point of death, even death on the cross. But just as Jesus sent his disciples in Mark 6, he's sending you. We have a command from our Lord as well. And yes, it is a command. It isn't a request. He doesn't say to us when you feel like it or if it isn't too much trouble. In fact, he appeals to his own ultimate authority right before he gives us this command. You probably know it as the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And before he begins the command, he says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
Just like he sent his disciples out in Mark 6, he is sending you. Now you might be wondering, how can I face this? How can I deal with the rejection and the risk? And we're reminded by Paul once again, Christ's power is made perfect in our weakness. This command doesn't expect perfection from the disciples, but it expects us to point to perfection in Jesus. And not only that, but that text in Matthew 28 ends with God's promise to you as he sends you out. He says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He doesn't send you out on your own. He goes with you wherever you go. He gives you the words to speak, his own words, which we heard read here today. And these are words of love, of life, of repentance, and everlasting salvation. So as you sing this song here in a moment and contemplate the words of the song, remember the command and promise of our Lord. Yes, you are called to face rejection for telling the story of Jesus and his love for the world, but he is with you every step of the way. Every step of the way, he is reminding you of the promises he has given to you, that you are forgiven of your sins your imperfections, your failures. That your life has been purchased through the sacrifice of his body and his blood and that you have life forever in him. That's the story. That's the great and wondrous story that we are to tell of Jesus and his love. May God grant you zeal, courage in his name and promises for they are yours in Jesus and gentleness as you are sent out from this place to tell others of Jesus and his love. Be blessed and assured by his abiding presence and the promise that you are a forgiven, redeemed child of God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please rise.